Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Brian Jester, co-founder here at Occupy Fantasy. We reached the conclusion of the Million Dollar Mission. 17 weeks of reviewing my results, my 150 NFL DFS lineups on FanDuel and DraftKings. Every single week, we put all the videos together in our Million Dollar Mission 2020 playlist here on YouTube. So check it out. You get access to every single Million Dollar Mission we did. Lots of high-level strategy discussion. Tons of videos to watch during the NFL offseason to help you for future NFL DFS slates. I think you'll learn a lot from it. In this particular Week 17 episode on Twitch, it was a different beast. Week 17, 15 games. So we talked about how to normally attack 15-game slates, how to attack Week 17 when there's so much news. Talked about splitting it up, maybe playing the early slates, playing the afternoon slates instead. Talked about how to manage a player pool of this size, how many players to pick at each position. Some of the big mistakes I made talked about just having high level strategies and rules to live by in DFS. That way you're not evaluating things on a case by case basis. Lots of lots of strategy in this particular episode. So again, 17 weeks of it. Go check it out. Follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Occupy Fantasy for some more content we'll be putting out. And if you enjoyed the Million Dollar Mission series, You'll love my 10K bankroll challenge on Yahoo, where I'm trying to turn zero dollars, that's right, starting with zero, all the way into $10,000 during the 2021 calendar year. We're doing an article every single week at OccupyFantasy.com, where I detail that journey. So go check that out if you like it. Again, we thank you for following along for 17 weeks. Million Dollar Mission didn't hit it again, but I think we learned a lot along the way. What's going on, everybody? It is Moose and Brian here from OccupyFantasy.com at Occupy Fantasy on Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Yeah, I'm here with Brian, at Brian Chester FF on Twitter, here to break down his million dollar mission, the season finale, I guess you would say, uh, where we break down his lineups, his 150 max lineups, take a look at what other people did, uh, who won 50 max, answer your all's questions, and uh, we'll go from there. So how's it going, Brian? Most feeling good. Uh, yeah, the equivalent of like binge watching a Netflix show, right? It's like if you watch it live when it's on actual TV, then uh, you have to wait each week for the episode. You have to wait a whole few months for the next episodes. But if you're watching this in 2023, then you've already caught up on every episode of Million Dollar Mission. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I will say, uh, very bold of us to live stream during Games Done Quick, which I don't know, Brian, if you've ever heard of it, but basically a charity event where they do speed runs and then people will have a like a donation incentive where it's like uh people like which character should i choose in this game to start out with and people donate and whoever the highest one is the person that's picked that character oh that's pretty cool i, yeah. I gotta be honest i'm surprised they're streaming during the occupy fantasy live stream seems like a bad <laughs> a bad time for them yeah absolutely so uh, but we're not here to, to speed run games or anything like that. We're here to take a look at how Brian did on DraftKings and FanDuel. Um, so we go ahead and take a look at how he did. Uh, it's hashtag week 17, which usually means not very good. So we'll take a look at how he did on FanDuel. 2466 in entries, $857 in winnings for a sweet minus 65% ROI. Yeah, I think one of the worst ROIs of the year, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, no surprise, still haven't learned my lesson. Still play week 17, uh, despite it being a massive slate. Always talk myself into it by Saturday. And uh, Moose, I'm telling you, this time next year, I'm not going to play week 17. You've said that the last, like, six years, and it just doesn't happen. But I'm actually not going to do it. This year, I'm tightening my, my contest selection up to a whole new levels. So weeks one through four, I'm limiting my allocation. Week 17, I'm not playing. Or, like, what if you just played it a different way? Whereas, like, what if you played 100-player leagues, more satellites, stuff like that? I guess that's possible too. That's definitely possible. Um, I could find better ways to spend twenty five hundred dollars than <laughs> than air yeah. ball and GPP for sure. I was gonna say because the last time you had went an NFL week without any actions, probably like ten years. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe since the womb. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if we hop over on DraftKings, take a look. Uh, Eighteen hundred in entries, four hundred seventy five dollars in winnings for a minus 74% ROI. Real sick. So I, it's kind of funny because I thought I did a lot better on DraftKings than what yeah. I ended up doing. Um, so my contest selection this week, 
I played the main slate on FanDuel because uh, they had at least some of the better contests for the main slate. And then DraftKings, I didn't want two sets of 150 on the main slate. I wanted to break it up some. And so the afternoon slate had the honestly had the larger payouts for me. So I played the afternoon only on DraftKings, the $12 entry. Um, but what killed me on both, and we'll talk about this in a second, I had 50 to 60% Malcolm Brown exposure on both sites, and he played like five snaps, so that yeah. was killer. Yeah, definitely. So um, just get these negative numbers out of the way. Let's take a look at how you've done for the year uh, on both sites combined. And is this the right one? Yep. 70.1K in entries, 167K in winnings for a 139% ROI. So successful year. Didn't hit the million dollars came really close two different times but uh yeah i mean we'll take those sweats all day we'll take these results all day in nfl classic uh have only had these results in every other sport <laughs> yeah exactly that that would be nice uh forgot to shout out the people that's in the chat here uh, swag lord ken star lord's dad uh rough month who's on a two months of uh, subscription streak then it's subscribed for a total of three months says what's up what's going on everybody bag who's says if week 16 was good it'll be hard to pass week 17. <laughs> I know. I'm going to try not to be recency biased, but um, I mean, and this is, we've talked about this before. Weeks one through four, I've never had a winning week. Week 17, I've never had a winning week. FanDuel, DraftKings, since I've been playing DFS. Um, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Most of our model doesn't kick into high gear until week five. Week 17 is a large slate with all kinds of craziness happening. So um, yeah, next year, I'm going to limit, completely, completely limit allocation those weeks. Load up. Basically play what I would have played in weeks one through four and week 17, add a little extra to each slate weeks five through 16, which is my bread and butter. Um, I think we'll see better results that way. Yeah, I mean, cause if you just didn't play weeks one through four and week 17, your ROI would be over 200% for the year. <laughs> so there, there you go. And honestly, probably higher if I allocated more money during those those, those uh, sweet spot weeks. Exactly, yeah. Uh, what's up, Jay Calloway? Says, what's up? What's going on everybody? Uh, and then, Thank you, Bismo, for the chart. So let's show up the chart one last time for the year. Final ROI, like I said, plus 139%. Uh, so you see here, you start off weeks one through four, trash. Week five, you literally <laughs> almost spike week. Uh, and then week nine was another spike week. Same thing with week yep. 15. And then again, week 17 was down. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, this is literally what my chart looks like every year, right? A couple spikes yeah. in the middle there absolute garbage on the bookends so uh yeah we'll see we're gonna try to again it's it's really tough right you th especially uh you know get close to the million twice win multiple large field gpps in nfl classic i mean we do i do this every day we do this every day full time and so um you know you, you have confidence in your abilities but when the records show this and we can provide reasons behind some of the negative roi weeks I'm really going to clamp down next year. I really am going to do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of fat to trim. And not yeah. just for me, but for all DFS players, right? Find out the contest you're good at and you're not. The weeks you're not. When we talk about the ultimate guide, like don't play MLB in August because it's so freaking tough for a variety of reasons. And I think the same thing applies for me personally by looking at my results for these weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's funny you point out that don't play MLB in August, whereas, uh, you know, we kind of have a, a guideline to go with uh, contest selection and kind of right, like, like we'll look at and it'll say kind of, hey, these are the contests you should play. Literally in August, it'll literally say, it's not hard coded if August, but no, literally it'll be like, don't play any contests as soon as August 1st. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the all the factors we look at basically turn point to don't play MLB in August. And those factors for me point to don't play NFL in weeks one through four and then week 17. <laughs> yeah, uh, as Nono says, only play week nine. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, I, can't remember, I can't remember when my, my big win was last year. Um, Obviously week 15, but I think it was like week 10 or so. But yeah, definitely in that, that middle mark for sure. Definitely. Uh, Callaway says, can't wait for that Super Bowl spike. That'll be nice. Uh, I'll take that, believe me. <laughs> um, yeah, if we have to wait until the Super Bowl for a spike, I'll certainly be okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's tickets out now on FanDuel for the big game bowl. I don't think they can actually say that word. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if we can or not. But um, we yeah. can say it's a Super Bowl. No, we can I'm say joking. it. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> because literally, if you go anywhere that involves gambling, they will never say Super Bowl ever. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I guess there's copyrights and like, uh, like, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the actual reason. Things is. like trademarked. I think. I guess. 
is what I would say. No, I don't, I don't know. Stupid. But whatever. Um, yeah. When we go to our when we go to our big game parties in Vegas, right? I know, right? Um, yeah, as Ruff says, if they're asking for saying the Super Bowl, <laughs> yeah, Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, I know Brian and Chip before the stream, we were talking about how we wanted to do this tonight. And you said you want to talk about how Week 17 was way different than normal weeks. Players resting starters. Twitter clearly had a, a fun time with that resting starters. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, how do you want to do this? Do you want to pull up Fantasy Labs Contest dashboard? Do you want to just keep the logo on? Um, how do you want to do this? Yeah, we can pull up the dashboard. Just look at my exposures. We'll keep that on the screen for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think week fifteen, um, or week seventeen was obviously interesting because of the fifteen games. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, I, I imagine. Like, if I was a member, I'd be pretty upset uh, about our analysis of Malcolm Brown, right? Like, we told you guys to play Malcolm Brown heavily. He obviously didn't play as much as we thought he would perform like we thought he would. So if I was listening, I mean, because, you know, the Cam Akers news came out, we were adamant, and it wasn't like a take-lock situation where we, we were on Malcolm Brown and we were going to stay on Malcolm Brown regardless. Yeah, It's really a, a heuristics type of thing. And I have a lot of, like, high-level heuristics that I follow in DFS that really streamline the process and are right more often than they're wrong. They're not right 100% of the time, but instead of trying to evaluate a case by case basis where you're going to end up being way more wrong than you should be, or close to 50, 50 at best. If we follow these high level rules, your, your process is so much easier and you're going to be more profitable in the long term. So the reason I say that for this particular is if a running back is coming off a high ankle sprain, and has, if they have limited practice, first of all, it's a little sketchy, but Cam yeah. Akers literally had practiced like a handful of snaps on Friday after not practicing for two weeks. In that situation, more likely than not, that player is not gonna play. And if they do, it's emergency only. And if they do play, they re-injure it or they're ineffective. Now, Cam Akers comes out, he was wildly ineffective. Didn't even average two yards per carry. But the coaching staff, which is something that's out of our hands, decided to run him out there for 25 rushing attempts or whatever it is. But if I try to individualize each situation, one, it takes a bunch of time. Two, I'm yeah. going to be wrong more often than not. If I, every time I say there's a running back with no practice on a high ankle sprain, I fade them or play the backup, I'm going to be more right in the long run. It's the same when it's cold, it's you know below freezing, the same when it's super windy, fading passing games. It's the same when, um, I don't know, there are a bunch of other ones like this. Obviously, each situation is different, but over the long haul, it, it plays out more in your favor than it does trying to do it in each case by case. Yeah, no, I totally, completely understand with you there. As Patrick says, yeah, but you guys got Gabriel Davis, though. Don't sweat Malcolm Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, yeah, it, and... it kind of, I was going to say, it, the tweet that Chris put out, I, I, wish I, I wish I still had it, but he was like, when you have a running back with a bum ankle who averages a yard a carry, you have to run him 34 times. Like, that was just, <laughs> that was just a bad move. <laughs> yeah, it was just, um... Uh, yeah, hard headedness on yeah. on the Rams coach. That obviously we're not in the medical room, so we don't know like, exactly what was going on. But if it's a high ankle sprain, he practiced for like five seconds on Friday. He's probably not even close to healthy, and you have a fully capable backup. It's not like it was like practice squad guys behind him, right? Yeah. Malcolm Brown, veteran. So, um, again, this was uh, I think it was like a showdown slate. Uh, oh, Devonte Adams when he caught like a billion touchdowns. Um, when you get word like that, that the field's not going to change their approach. And uh, we know historically the situation has been favorable one way or the other, and the field doesn't change it. Then obviously it might not work out, and Rodgers throws four touchdowns, and Devontae catches three of them, mm -hmm. or Malcolm Brown gets five carries at two percent ownership. Sure, it's not going to work out all the time, but again, over the long haul, these situations, these averages pan out. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool, cool, cool. So let's take a look here. Uh, I have the DraftKings main slate. And did you play the Millionaire Maker on that slate or no? I didn't play the main slate. I only played the afternoon slate. Okay. Yeah. So Fancy Labs actually only has the main slate for DraftKings. So. All right. Um, which, uh, what do. excuse me here. Um, I will just take a look here. Uh, I will shout out this guy who had, guy who won it, had one entry, which is always, always cool to see. So sick. In like the most ridiculous lineup ever, right? It was like a, a two by oh Kirk Cousins stack, I think. Yeah, let's pull up the lead. Oh, no, it was the two by one. The two by one. He had Marvin Jones in there too. Yeah. So um, I tried to click the leaderboard. I think it crashed. But uh, yeah, 
the two by one in there. Yeah, so that's uh, did he? No, yeah, two by one, right? He he stacked him. He stacked him with a running back, Madison, um, and then ran him back with Marvin Jones. So two by one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, I see that. Yeah, um, yeah, great lineup. Uh, Jets defense somehow pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a pretty sharp. I, I, you know, the Jets defense was pretty sharp. We're going against uh, Cam Newton, potentially Jared Stidham. Um, a lot of the plays in this lineup individually were pretty sharp. So um, a great lineup by a uh, person with the one entry for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, is there anybody that that 150 max that you wanted to take a look at and see what their exposures were? Um, let's look at let's look at like uh, I don't know. Um, give me a sec here. I'm gonna think of someone that we should look at. Okay. Uh, um. I also want to know if, if you guys are watching this live, um, any questions you have about approaching week 17? Because uh, I know a lot of people talked about Moose player pool size and try to pare down yeah. the player pool, given how many freaking guys were in the in the in the player pool. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was tough because I ran. I must have run the opt. I must have run DFS Magic four thousand times this week. <laughs> yeah. It went from yeah. Like at first, I was like, all right, let me just add everyone who I think I like. Ended up with like right. an 85 player pool. I was like, I can't do this. Ended up trimming it down to about 60. I think 62 is what I ended up with. Uh, and couldn't really, uh, it, I, I didn't like it. Uh, it was funny. I tweeted, or uh, I sent in Snapchat. I was like, this is the greatest I feel about my lineups all season, which means I'm definitely going over 150 and ended up, I think, catching like five <laughs> or something. Yeah, that's definitely how it works out for sure. Yeah. Um, I say we look at uh, Chipotle Attic, Papa Gates, those guys. Um, traditionally one of the, the best duos yeah. <laughs> in NFL for sure. Absolutely. So let's see what they did in the Millionaire Maker. All right, let's see. So let's see. So Chipotle Attic, uh, sorting by leverage, his highest leverage had three players over, uh, or four players over 30%, Keelan Cole, Chris Carson, Marvin Jones, and Noah Fant. So let's talk about these guys, why that may be. So Keelan Cole, obviously, um, DJ Chark was out, so that was that would be a boost to his expectations. Uh, Chris Carson, Carlos Hyde was out. San Francisco had a billion injuries on defense, boosted his expectation. Marvin Jones, still no Kenny Galladay. Matthew Stafford playing versus a terrible defense, makes sense. Noah Fant, uh, I think he was like top five or top seven in our model, so I imagine they, had, they saw similar numbers in whatever models they use. So it kind of makes sense to me. No real surprises there. Yeah, absolutely. And if we take a look at the other person you want to look at, um, Bobby Gates. Let's take a look at him. If my internet decides to work properly. <laughs> there we go. Um, he had several more players over that uh, over that 30% leverage mark. Robbie Anderson, Chris Carson, Emmanuel Sanders, Josh Jacobs, Keelan Cole, Chris Conley, Bridgewater, Marvin Jones, DJ Moore. So a lot, a lot more players over 30% leverage. Yeah, obviously a lot of overlap between the two. Um, but Chris Conley, love to see that. <laughs> Glad to see I wasn't the only one playing a decent amount of Chris Conley. But yeah, uh, wow, he had 35% exposure. So he was big on the Jags passing game. Sucks that LaVisca was the, the Jags receiver who went off for these guys. I know, it's, uh, it sucks. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, Anderson a little questionable. I don't know why uh, he had a lot of him. Carson we talked about already. Emmanuel Sanders with no Camara and no Michael Thomas. That makes a ton of sense. Josh Jacobs was completely overlooked by everyone. Um, he must have, and then Teddy and DJ Moore, I imagine he stacked that game pretty heavily, it seems like. Yeah, that's what it looks like here as well, yeah. Um, let's see here. Ken says, all right, here's my question for week 17. Why ever play it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, bro. It's, it, we get we get flashbacks, right? We get to play these guys from preseason, but um, you know the scores are so high. And I, I think a great way to think about this is and it sounds crazy for DFS, I think Bales has talked about this from Fantasy Labs, is, um, you know, when you're playing GPPs, the question shouldn't be, how can I score the most points to yeah. win? The question should be, how can I score the least amount of points and still win? And it sounds similar, but it's different questions because if all the chalk hits, if there's 15 games of action, you're gonna need a lot higher score to beat everyone, where if the chalk busts, lower game stacks go off, um, there are less less games to go by, then there's less points you have to score, the less you have to do with a DFS player. So with a 15-game slate, you have to get a lot of things right and a lot of things perfect 
to win those GPPs, those high risk contests in week 17. I think we see that here in the results. Especially with, what is it? I don't know how many entries this is. What, almost 200,000 entries where pretty much all the major combinations are going to be there. Yeah, no, yeah, 100% right, right? When when multiple guys go off for 30, 40 points, the top of the leaderboard in a 15-game slate is going to have those guys. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, forgot to say, Ed, he said, what's up? We talking 444 NBA yet? Uh, Ed, I'm with you, buddy. I got a couple tickets for, for Wednesday, too. So um, I'll be in the Discord just like you asking questions because <laughs> I'm not a good NBA player. Yeah, definitely. Starlo's dad says, Marvin Jones was a risky surprise because the week before I left the game with an ankle sprain to kill all my Jones Jr. lineups. Oh, Stafford. Yeah. Um, yeah. The thing was, like, it, it seemed like just a, a fluke injury, and he's a tough guy, going to play through everything. So when I saw that he was going to play, I figured unless he got another fluke injury, he was going to play the whole game. At least that was my thinking. Yeah. Um, I imagine that. And the total kept increasing, too, and didn't go down. So the, the betting markets weren't worried about Stafford leaving because I guarantee you most if Chase Daniel was going to be under center for a while or David Blau, whoever, that total would have dropped. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, speaking of the betting market, so I, I do want to say it was funny when that bit, the Miami spread went like six points in their direction. Total went down because I guess everyone thought Bill starters weren't going to play hardly anything. Uh, people were saying bet the Bills first quarter because their stars were and then they just they lost the first quarter and then just absolutely dominated <laughs> the rest of the game. It was yeah. Very tilting. What a, <laughs> the exact opposite of how that game should have went. Yeah. Um, I, the, dude, the Bills backups beat beat them for three quarters so pretty nuts uh definitely yeah Notum says marvin is a classic guy to play off bad games because he burns people yeah i thought so too i was kind of surprised to see how highly owned he was he was like 11 percent on fan i think around what was he on on drafting here most marvin Jones? uh let's see here oh yeah also 11 percent uh, so yeah 11 I mean, yeah. not that insignificant on a 15 game slate exactly yes um I, i'm actually curious i want to look at the team stacks for this slate the highest stack was at 4.9%. Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, two-player stack. Uh, that, all, the all cousins, the that cousins, yeah, that cousins line, uh, cousins was really popular, right? Yeah, and I mean, the top one percent had 13% of this two two-man combination here. Christ, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, so I mean, that that kind of shows too, right? When the most popular two-man stack is tripled in the top 0.1%, it was a pretty chalky slate in, in that regard. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if we take a look at game stacks, uh, again, player, players from two different teams, Derrick Henry and Brandon Cooks was the most popular, 1.7% of the field doing that. Uh, yeah, and they both absolutely dominated. Yeah, and I'm looking, I'm trying <laughs> to see here if I can filter out to see, yeah, the, so the top four-man stack, Kirk, DeAndre Swift, Justin Jefferson, Irv Smith, 0.3%, which is, I would not... Suggest I would not. I would be very surprised if that was the, the top four man stack in terms of ownership. Yeah, I don't think it is. Um, I would imagine it was that that second one seems more likely to me. Yeah, I don't know. Who, who knows? Um, Either way, but I mean, again, yeah. this this is why scores yeah. are so high. I, I think probably why I had a negative ROI. And <laughs> Malcolm Brown not helping at all either. But like when the most popular two man stacks, both from quarterback receiver perspective and like mini game stacks, go off like that. Uh, it's gonna be a rough times for me. Gonna oh, yeah. have a bad time. <laughs> gonna have a bad time, definitely. So uh, I also wanted to check because there was so much. Like week seventeen is a different piece. It's almost like a preseason where salary necessarily doesn't really matter. Right. So if we take a look here, but still, fifty percent of the lineups use the entire salary cap. Yeah, and I, I you know, my thought was uh, along your lines too, Moose. Like maybe we don't need to use the whole salary cap, but like. A lot of the top 0.1% lineups over the last three week 17s have been right near 50K. So um, despite getting a lot of guys who are sitting out and backups coming in, I mean, we had a bunch of min price plays we could have played this week. Yeah. It just means that you could fit in more studs, especially on DraftKings where the pricing is tighter. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and if we take a look at the flex users that we like to see, 13% of people use a double tight end. How many uh, How many in top 0.1%? 4.65 good nothing nothing brings me more joy than seeing that chart at a downward angle yeah exactly i absolutely love to see that one there mm -hmm. um and the other thing we like to look at is duplicates um if we sort by the number of users that duplicate so this lineup was duplicated 67 times i don't know why uh, 
But yeah, it's it's, it's got it's the one optimizer yeah. every week that pulls in the double tight ends that people just run every single time. Every single time, without question, the most duplicated lineup in the millionaire is going to be a, a two tight end lineup from some optimizer. It's kind of yeah. crazy. I'm curious, why, like, why was Ty Johnson so so heavily duplicated on, on a lot of these lineups? Was he? I didn't think he'd be that popular of a of a, of a projection play. Yeah, I thought Ty Montgomery um, would have beaten him here. So it must have been a weird quirk from whatever optimizer these player these players were using because yeah as a as a ownership raw projection Ty Montgomery definitely projected better than him yeah definitely um and so cool 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 so we have about seven minutes left before we get up out of here if you guys have any last questions definitely go ahead and ask um rough says is that free or do you have to have fancy lab stuff to see that stuff no it's free you just need to have like an account with them you don't have to pay for anything um just sign up with your email and you'll be able to see this yeah, and again, if, if you've watched these videos or not, and you're not sure, like these dashboards, whether it's the Roto Grinders Results DB, whether it's this Fantasy Labs Contest dashboard, whatever else is out there, these are how you can improve your GPP games. Looking at rankings, see what the top players are, and see what they do, because you can literally see what they do with their lineups, their exposures, how they build lineups, what the field does, what works, what doesn't. Uh, this is how you become a better GPP player in any sport, um, not just NFL. Yep, absolutely. Cool. cool. Uh, Sorrow's ass is next week, next year, week 17. I'm playing all players that I'm sentenced to achieve this year Brady, Brown, etc. Sanders. Yeah, I mean, they threw AB the ball like 37 times, gave him three jets, jet sweeps at the end to hit 11 receptions. Yeah, he went off <laughs> absolutely um, nuts. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a good call. We see this a lot. Um, it's tough to find that information sometimes, but Schefter will tweet it out on Sunday mornings. Yeah, that's uh. Yeah, that's going to have to be in the next Occupy model, the the, the version 7 of NFL, <laughs> if it has incentives. Um, yeah, get that achievement boost. <laughs> Ruff says, what's the best way to use the OF index to determine a lineup's expected value? Is there a formula to calculate something like that using the OF index number and or ownership? That way we can compare lineup EV to GPP EV, or is that pointless to even do this? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. We get this a lot, especially people like building multiple lineups in DFS Magic or the, the lineup builder and trying to sort afterwards and picking their, their quote unquote best X number of lineups. Um, yeah, it's kind of tough, right? Like, again, I don't even look at ownership really in NFL. I know it's, that's blasphemous to say. I don't really look at it for GPPs. I'm just more about stacking and getting my exposures right. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I think it is kind of a fruitless effort. Um, you know, trying to pick your best ones, trying to find you know, quote unquote, leverage OF index versus ownership or whatever it may be. Um, so again, I, I don't know, most of you have a different take on this. I don't know if you, if you do or not. It's tough because the OF index is generally speaking towards for high risk lineups. I would say yeah. like, if you have a high OF index lineup, it's probably going to be somewhat EV. Uh, and, yeah. if you're stacking, yeah. if you, and if you're stacking properly, then you're probably going to have plus EV lineup. If you have underperforming wide receiver in there as well, it's going to be an EV lineup. So I think this is going to sound really bad. I don't think the OF index matters that much when you're playing these big contests, these, these millionaire makers, uh, the rush, all the other kind of those big contests, that's more lineup based where you need to make sure you're stacking properly. You need to have the right players in the, in your pool. OF index, yes, absolutely matters. Um, but I think it matters more in like hundred player leagues. These, uh, and I think it's up, stuff like that. Yeah, and I think it's tough even like comparing lineups against each other. Like if yeah. uh, one is like a combined OF index of 306 versus 300, like is the 306 that much better? Not necessarily, right? Yeah. So um, a long long way of saying it's really tough to do that, Rough. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only thing would be is just like, is this, again, going back to stacking, playing underperforming wide receivers, uh, high. I think the only time it would matter is in like defense. Whereas like if you... I, very rarely we yeah. play a, a very shitty like one one of index defense yeah same for me like tight ends and defense like i'm i'm i purely uh follow the model the top the top few plays and I, it, you know every couple of weeks i'll be like i really like this guy and he's like the 15th ranked tight end uh, i gotta get him in and then he scores like three points every time so yeah um I, I, I just stick to the model for defense and tight ends and that's probably the best indicator of of index yeah absolutely so uh, awesome, awesome. So we have three minutes left for the se season finale. If you're here on YouTube, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and comment if you want to. Uh, if you're here on Twitch, again, remember, uh, we have two, two minutes left. 
to answer your questions, Brian. Is there anything that you want to take away that you learned? I'm going to ask you this. What's one thing you learned and one thing that confirmed your, your belief this NFL season? Cool. Good, really good question. I will, before I answer that question, because I do want to say before we get out of here, um, this is the final million dollar mission, but I am starting that 10K bankroll challenge on Yahoo. And so uh, we're going to be writing about that every single week, maybe do some twitches about it. So if you're looking for high level strategy type stuff, um, you'll be in, if you like this, you'll, you'll tune into that as well. And I think you'll like that. Um, things I learned this year, um, I think the thing I learned the most is, you know, to not be too married to the three by one stacks with rushing quarterbacks mm -hmm. this year was the most rushing yards we've ever seen by quarterbacks combined since the history of the nfl right so um guys like jalen hurts kyler murray lamar jackson not necessarily having the three by one stack those guys but the thing that confirmed my beliefs was that for not those guys three by one stack is still the way to go yeah. not much has changed right playing high volume running backs underperforming wide receivers three by one stacking again that led me to over 100k in profits once again this year, and we're gonna f we're gonna research stuff again just to make sure. But for the foreseeable future, looks like that's the most profitable way to play NFL tournaments. I thought you, I, I would have bet money, I would have lost everything I had. I thought you were gonna say what confirmed your belief was that uh, the cheap player in a stack. Oh, I didn't even, yeah, for, I forgot that. Yeah, the, we we discovered that, we learned that, and and confirmed it in the same season. Right, we've yeah. unveiled that in the middle of the year, and then like I immediately won 50k with it. So um, that's another, that's a new thing we learned, but it was also confirmed basically nearly immediately. Yep, absolutely. And Starlord's dad says, when are you starting the NBA mission? <laughs> you want us to you talk about uh, uh, valleys in a graph? That shit would just be straight down. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I got some monster tickets tomorrow. Maybe I'll win and we'll go. We'll get a spike week, but um, I'm still putting in the effort behind the scenes to to learn. The right way to play NBA DFS tournaments, so uh, I'm not confident in playing a ton of money just yet. Yeah, I mean NBA is such a completely Tough. different beast. You can't even compare it to MLB, uh, any other like MLB or NHL. Those kind of daily sports, it's just it's ridiculous. It is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that that pretty much wraps it up. Again, guys, I'm pretty sure everyone here is on the Discord, so if you have more questions, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, but until Saturday. We're not sure yet on the time, but uh, we'll be doing something Saturday for the NFL slate. Until then, maybe, maybe Friday night. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Uh, we'll post in the Discord and let you guys know. So yeah. until then, uh, Lewis and Brian from Occupy Fantasy. Peace out. Peace.